So where are we? We so far have always assumed we have a base solution, some solution. And um, we've assumed we had that solution. We did a linear stability calculation where we then found where it become unstable, say, or change stability. And then um, a bifurcation occurred, for instance, a pitchfork bifurcation. So that's like that. And what we did was we focused on the immediate vicinity of that bifurcation point and did a local analysis there. That was possible analytically and that was, is, uh, was quite successful. We can do that now even in high dimensions. Okay. Um, but sometimes one gets actually more complicated scenarios. We actually had one situation like that when we had our pitchfork bifurcation, but it was subcritical. So we had this basic state became unstable and became unstable in a subcritical bifurcation like this. And uh, at that point we said, well, this is not very um, satisfying because we have in this regime, no stable solution whatsoever. We don't know what's going to happen. So we included quintic terms in that equation. And when we just solved those equations, we got something where there's another branch showing up here, or it could be, it wasn't always the case, depending on parameters. Another branch showed up, um, which was stable. And so we then had a nice scenario, which however now actually involves three bifurcations, right? A subcritical pitchfork and two saddle node bifurcations. We analyzed that situation and we noticed that we actually can only trust this analysis if the cubic coefficient is very small, as in the bifurcation is only weakly subcritical. And uh, in general, when it's not weakly subcritical, meaning when really this Weakly subcritical means that this branch is essentially almost vertical. So it's between going forward and going backward. But if it's strongly subcritical, like indicated here, then we don't have any tool to actually generate a, something like that uh, realistically. So that's what we'd like to do now. We want to find out how we could do at least generate bifurcation diagrams like that, um, which will have to be numerically. But um, <clears throat> We would like to have you know, a handle on scenarios of that kind. Um, so how would we do that? Well, okay, so we knew we calculate numerically some basic solution. Okay, fine. Um, but we have to calculate it for a number of different parameter values and we have to follow that branch, right? So, and then we want to, Identify the bifurcation with linear stability. Okay, that's clear how one would do that. And then we need to be able to follow either this branch or that branch. And then we need to be able to follow that branch even when it turns around like that or at a fold as a saddle node bifurcation. So that's the tasks we have uh, ahead of us. So, okay, let's imagine what kind of numerical methods can we imagine just to followed that branch in the first place. Never mind the bifurcation yet. So of course we can just solve the differential equations. They are ODEs in time, so we can solve by time stepping. And so the way we do that, we could do that is um, we um, calculate for some initial condition and solution for this value of lambda, right? So oh, mu, this is our parameter mu, and this is x. And then we pick mu at a new value, say here, and take the previous solution as an initial guess, and then evolve in time and uh, hope that it will converge back to that stable branch. And so that's how we can sort of march along here. And that should work. Well, work is exaggerated because there's two problems. One problem is evident. Um, the fact that we go back to that branch relies, of course, on this solution being stable. If you did the same thing here, you start with this solution, do a little step in mu, and then start with this initial condition, it's not gonna be going to that branch, it's actually gonna go to that branch, and so much for following this branch. So that's not gonna work. 
actually there's more subtle things which also will be a problem if you approach that bifurcation point which of course is the most interesting point here we know at the bifurcation point this guy this solution changes stability meaning the branch here becomes less and less stable as in the eigenvalue gets smaller so the evolution towards that branch becomes slower and slower and one observes what's called critical slowing down um, meaning at the bifurcation point, the solution is not approached exponentially anymore, but much slower just in, in, in terms of a power law. And so therefore you will not be able to get to this uh, bifurcation point very efficiently with this method. Okay, so that's two problems if you do time stepping. Well, we can find a solution also by, if you're looking for fixed points, right now we're just talking about fixed points, then we can also look at root finding methods, right? So we can just, I mean, the fixed point is given by an equation f of x and mu equals zero. Okay, and so we just have some root finding method, finding the zeros of that function. And uh, <clears throat> if we do that, then both of the problems I just mentioned will go away uh, because the eigenvalue here does not play a role at all in when you find just the root of that equation. And the stability of that branch doesn't play a role either. So you will not be slowed down when you get to the bifurcation point, and you will also be able to find unstable solutions. Now let me maybe just make a remark. You can say, well, why do I care about unstable solutions? In the experiment, the real world, they're not gonna show up. Well, they're not gonna show up maybe explicitly like that you go there, that the experiment really goes there. But the fact that you have, for instance, here, this unstable solution has a big impact in terms of when you make a perturbation on that basic branch, if you make a small perturbation, you go back here, whereas if you make a perturbation beyond that unstable solution, you go back there. So knowing about where that sta unstable solution is will tell you a lot about what the dynamics are. Because the dynamics in phase space are controlled not only by the stable, but also by the unstable solutions. Okay, so root finding. So let me just remind you of the standard root finding technique, which is Newton's method. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know that, but uh, I just want to mention it because it is really very important. So we want to have, uh, we're iterating, we're going from some xk to an xk plus one, and hopefully as we keep iterating, that will converge to the, um, to the fixed point, to the, to the root of that equation. And so the idea is that you have this function f and what you would like to have that at the k plus first iterate, given that parameter that we have, uh, given a mu, uh, you would like this to be zero, right? Then it would be a fixed point. Now that's not gonna happen, but the way you get the iteration scheme is by you said, well, I'm approximating f of xk plus one. I don't know what xk plus one is. I only know xk. I do that with a Taylor series. And so I have, this is going to be xk plus the derivative, the Jacobian. Let me write it this way. The Jacobian with respect to x of xk times xk plus one minus xk and uh, plus i orders. So now you have an equation that you solve for xk plus one and you get the iteration scheme xk plus one is equal to xk minus f of xk, I need more space, minus f of xk divided by the Jacobian, well not divided of course, uh, the inverse of the Jacobian evaluated at that point. So that's the Newton iteration. Um, so let me just make one remark. Calculating inverses is always uh, sort of slow. So it's better to not solve it, proceed in this way, but rather uh, multiply the whole equation by the inverse as in, yeah, I shouldn't say that. Just take in this equation, uh, solve the linear equation fx, the Jacobian of xk, times xk plus one equals um, 
f x of uh, x k times x k um, minus f of x k. So in that case, you only you only need to solve this equation. It's just a linear equation solver, and you only have to do it once. Whereas for the inverse, you have to do essentially this uh, n times. That's a minor thing, but it's it, you know you should keep that in mind whenever you implement Newton. That's the better way to go. Um, in the lecture notes, I give some more details on the following fact: that the, what, the reason that Newton is really so popular is because it converges super exponentially to the fixed point, to the root. As I said, I, I put, put that in the notes. I'm not going to talk about it here. Let me just sort of mention what super exponentially mean. Well, if you, if you had an exponential approach, then in each step, you would reduce the error by the same factor. So say, just to pick some numbers, if you had in the first step, maybe the error would, go down, would be 0.1. Then the next uh, um, step, it would be 0 0.01, and then it would be 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So if, that, if you had an exponential approach, you would sort of have in each step, the accuracy would increase by one digit, so to speak, if, you know, if it so happens that that uh, approach is by a factor of 10 each time. It could be a different factor, but the factor is constant. Whereas in the super exponential, you would also have, you know, maybe in the first step, 10 to the minus 1, then you would have 10 to the minus 2, but then you have 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 16, meaning the number of digits in each step doubles, rather, is increased by 1. So that's the super exponential convergence of the Newton, which, of course, is extremely powerful. As you also know, the Newton is great when it works, and um, when it doesn't work, it just goes into the boonies. So what you need is a good starting solution. Right? So that's why in, re in practice, when you do that, you, you're following, you want to march along this branch, right? And so you take the solution, converge to it, then you take a small step. So you have a good guess for the new solution and so on. You don't take a gigantic step and hope that it will converge. You take small steps and it will then converge and work very well. Okay, so now we know how we could follow this branch, um, which is good. Um, but we have two problems. We pointed out two more problems, which we have not solved yet. One is that if we want to follow a branch, say this branch along the bifurcation point, this is not going to happen the way we just say, because say if I wanted to change, I wanted to follow along this line, I, what I would do is I, I'm starting here, I then decrease mu, right? I decrease mu, and um, then I converge to that solution, I decrease mu, I converge to that solution, and so on, and I decrease mu. Well, there's no solution to converge to it, we'll just go who knows where. But so I, I can't just step along in mu. I, I sort of have to have something that makes sure I'm going to follow along the branch. And so what we'll do is we'll parameterize this branch, not by mu, by some other parameter. The other thing we need to do after we figure out this thing is how to choose which branch to go to when we're at the bifurcation. Do we want to continue here or here? Um, here or here. So that's the other task. So there are two tasks that we have to still do, and we'll do that next time.